this next uh, <clears throat> hour and a half or what we have, <laughs> I'd like to concentrate on Christ's appearances to his prophets. And uh, <clears throat> we need to kind of center this in some things we've already said a few things about. Uh, let me just begin with this basic statement. Glorification in the Father gives Christ a divine indwelling relationship with the man of holiness, which is the key to a true understanding of Christ as the only begotten Son. You've got to understand the indwelling relationship. <clears throat> and we've talked about that. Uh, <clears throat> given you lecture five of the lectures on faith. Let me turn over to John chapter 14, where Jesus is with his disciples, and Philip, bless his heart, very naively, asks him a question. It's one of those questions where you look at the person and you kind of beat yourself on the head and say, hey, where have you been? <laughs> Haven't you picked up on it yet? It's one of those kinds of experiences, and Jesus did it very graciously, but rather pointedly. Uh, we're here in John chapter 14, and uh, we're dealing with uh, things from verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, shew us the Father, and it will suffice us. And it's at that point that Jesus <laughs> hey, kid, where have you been? You see that? Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, shew us the Father? Now, I know how we use that in the mission field, and I would still use it that way, because the application is correct, but it is an application. It's one of these things where a scripture in application means something different than what it means in reality. Now, in application, it says, I'm so much like the Father that if you were to see me, you would see him. And why are you talking about showing us the Father? Don't you know that I'm exactly like him? In the first vision, Joseph said that the two beings exactly resembled each other. And uh, we use that in, in the missionary work, and it's a legitimate use to show that Christ then is exactly like the Father. And if you've seen and Christ is just the revelation of the Father. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father. But that's the application. That's not really what he was saying. Now what was he really saying? You can't understand what he was saying until you understand the divine nature, until you understand the indwelling. The fact that the Father is in Christ. Again, we said, now draw a big circle and let that represent the Father. Draw another one over here and let that represent that Christ. And then put a transfer. It's like a huge electrical circuit. And then a, an arrow back through, see, so that the Father is in Christ and Christ is in the Father. And there's a great indwelling relationship, but it's, it's not electrical power, which is tremendously uh, energetic and, and shocking, to say the least. But it's the power of truth and intelligence. And uh, the person in whom it dwells then is independent by the nature of truth and uh, acts independent, as, but he still possesses the fullness of the Father. You see that? Now, when Christ was conceived on earth, the divine nature of the Father was centered in him. He wasn't just a physical being walking around on earth. He was God. He was Emmanuel, which means God with us. And as Abinadi said in his great commentary on the prophetic biography of, of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, which, is, which he includes in, in Mosiah chapter 14, the whole of the chapter is, is Isaiah 53. And then in chapter 15, 
Abinadi's great commentary, where he begins by saying, I would that you should know that God himself shall come down among the children of men, to redeem his people, saying. It's not elder brother, it's God himself. And when he came down on earth, the Father was in him, and he was the Father by reason of the indwelling of power and glory of the divine nature. And so he says now to Philip, Have I been so long time with you that you really haven't known me? He that has seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, shew us the Father? And then notice explanation, explanation. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Now, it isn't an issue for many of us, whether they believe or not, we don't even know about it. Now, believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, now he's talking about what he's giving, and he's not giving it by his own intellectual nature, he's giving it based on the flow of revelation within himself. And revelatorily, it's the Father that's giving it, see? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the words. You see that? All right, now, the Father and the Son have an indwelling relationship. And so you take these two circles, and you transfer the fullness of light and glory here over to this person here, and it doesn't destroy his, uh, his will, it doesn't disrupt his agency, it doesn't set it aside, it's truth. This person loves truth to the extent that he's willing to subordinate and surrender his will to the Father, see? And as a result, then, he grew up in the Father, to where the Father is in him and he is in the Father. Now, there needs to be another circle off over here, and that's us. That's what John 17 is all about, see? The great high priestly prayer which Jesus uttered prior to his uh, crucifixion, then, is on this theme. He says, for example, beginning here with the with verse 20, let me get to it, in uh, this uh, uh, very sacred and very meaningful prayer. He says, <clears throat> verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their words. Now, that includes us. Chapter 17, verse 20. Pardon? And now the purpose for it. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. Now what's he praying for? What, what's, what's he saying and what d does what he's saying mean? You see that? What does it mean? That, that they all, that includes us, may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be, be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, the only way you can really convince the world is to have a group of people who are in Christ, and he's in them, to the extent that the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night rests upon every dwelling place, and then they come around and say, oh, wow, this is better than Tommy Gaines, where did it come from? And you just say, you know, this is Christ. He's here. We're in him, and he's in us. And, and that isn't just light in the sense of the electrical bill that you have to pay to get it. This is glory. It's a radiance of light and life and glory, and people feel it. You can feel its power. It's a living power, and you can feel it. You'd walk right into it if it cost you your life. It's that attractive. You just, you, it's, it's living. And there's that indwelling, and the world knows then, or they finally have to sit back and say, we, we don't know anything about this. We know what electricity is, and we know what atomic energy is, but this stuff, see, and look what it does for you. Look at the beauty that's here. Now look at the peace that's here. Now look at the standard of social life that's here. Now look at the, the standard of economic life. 
where there's no quarrel among you, as it says with Enoch, see, and where the presence of God is there, see. Now, that's the thing that really converts. See, we're, we're, we've learned in the missionary thing that really converts is, is testimony. You teach by the power of testimony because the power of the Spirit flows with, with sincere testimony. Now, you add to that the endowment of glory on Zion, what do you do? But that's the standard, see, and that's how far we're living beneath the standard, beneath our privileges. Now, he goes on and says, to explain now, and the glory which thou gavest me, all right, the divine nature, the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. And that's what the gospel is about. It's not just the forgiveness of sins. It's the infusion of his spirit and truth and light. It's the flow. It's the living water that springs up into everlasting life. You see that? And it quickens and it gives life and it gives joy. And it brings humility and strength of character. But there's power there. You see that? There's life and there's power there. And he said, The glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And then he explains again, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. All right, now this indwelling relationship is the key to the understanding of Christ. Since the time of the fall... And I'll quote President Joe the Fielding Smith on this one. I, I give his quote in my Prolerita Price commentary where we talk, where we talk on this subject. But as President Joe the Fielding Smith said, since the fall, that person that we call the man of holiness, to whom we assign the exalted name title Elohim, that person has never said anything to the human family except to bear witness of Christ. The only thing the man of holiness has said revelatorily to the human family since the fall is, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. And he followed that same pattern on down through the ages and into the first vision, didn't he? The two personages appeared to the prophet. Who spoke first? The Father. What did he say? Joseph, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And who gave the explanation and the message to Joseph? Jesus did. All right? Now put that down as a basic principle that the Father has never said anything, nor will he say anything, revelatorily, in the way of explaining gospel truth and principles to anyone in his own person and by his own mouth. That will not be done. Why? Because he has centered in Christ the fullness of his power and his glory and established him as his revelatory source, as the revelator of the Father. You see that? Now, let me give you a few examples on that one. <clears throat> uh, you have, first of all, it's just uh, the idea, and this will come out in the prorate price, but let me get to the core of it a little easier here in the, the Book of Mormon. In Ether chapter 13, no, the chapter 3, pardon, verse 14, you have... Uh, the pre-earth Christ speaking to the brother of Jared. And he says, Behold, I am he who is prepared in the foundation of the world to redeem my people. Behold, I am Jesus Christ. I am the Father and the Son. Now, who is he? He's a dual being by what reason? By the indwelling of the divine nature within him. He's a dual. Uh, and he's revelatorily dual. He, he reveals himself as the Father, and he reveals himself as the Son. He speaks as the Father, and he speaks as the Son. 
Now that's hard for us here in this compartmentalized world that we're in, where things are here and here and here, and we don't see the picture of the divine nature. Then Jesus goes on and says, In me shall all mankind have life, and that eternally. Even they who shall believe on my name, and they shall become my sons and my daughters. And as his sons and his daughters, then we grow up to be glorified in him as he is glorified in the Father. And so there's three circles up here. You see that? And we're, and he's given us his glory that we might be one, that we might be in him, and that he might be in us. See? Now, again, uh, another chap- uh, verse here that's, uh, that's helpful. And that's Mormon chapter 9, uh, verse 12. It just, it's just an illusion. You, you get to, uh, the great classic statement on this. I won't take time on it, but, but read, for example, very, very carefully. Again, like a scientist would study a formula and really study it. Uh, chapter 15 of Mosiah. That's the classic statement in the Book of Mormon. Uh, here in, in Mormon 9, verse 12, Behold, he created Adam. And by Adam came the fall of man, and because of the fall of man came Jesus Christ, even the Father and the Son. All right, now, the Father is in Christ, and by appointment Christ speaks and acts and is the Father. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the author, and he's the finisher of our faith. Now, what's outside the beginning and the end? Nothing. Everything is in Christ. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You see that? And, in, and through him is revealed the fullness of the Godhead. And I put it that way? Through him is revealed the fullness of the Godhead. And you have a situation then where the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost is one God. Not are, is. Is one God. And that's the doctrine of Scripture. That's the doctrine of the Book of Mormon. For example, over here, uh, I didn't mean to bring this one up, but since we have, let me get to it. Over here in Alma's exchange and Amulet's exchange with the, uh, the lawyers, with the Zizrim at their head, they talk about the one God who is Jesus Christ. And then uh, in verse 44, you have this statement of Alma chapter 11. Now this restoration, speaking of the resurrection and so forth, should come to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, both the wicked and the righteous. And even there shall not so much as a hair of their heads be lost, but everything shall be restored to its perfect frame as it is now, or in the body, and shall be brought and arraigned before, and note this now, the bar of Christ the Son, and God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, which is one God. Now, which are, in the judgment, all judgment is turned over to Christ. That's just a basic gospel doctrine, isn't it? He's the righteous judge. You don't have three persons setting up there at the bar. The Father and the person, the Son and the, and the Holy Ghost, and we're brought up before the three. That is not the picture. You're brought to stand before Christ, the righteous judge, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He is one God. You see that? Now, that's the scriptural picture. And you don't pick that one up in the prayer of Christ and see its meaning. You just say, wow, there's something wrong with that one. Maybe there's a misprint. Uh, but there's not something wrong with it. Uh, that's, the, that's the doctrine, but we can't understand it unless you understand the divine nature and how it correlates and how it becomes the basis then of the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let me turn to section 49 as another example, just to show this, and then we'll get into the picture a little more fully. You tell me now who is speaking. <clears throat> this is verse 5, section 49. Thus saith the Lord, for I am God, and have sent mine only begotten Son into the world. Now note that. I have sent mine only begotten Son into the world for the redemption of the world, and have decreed 
that he that receiveth him shall be saved, and he that receiveth him not shall be damned. Now, who's speaking in the sense of the articulation of what is said? Who's speaking? Turn over to the end of the Revelation, verse 28. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, and I come quickly. You can saw him in. Now, who's speaking? Christ, in what office and power? As the Father. Can you see that? Now that, that then is the picture of the, of the scriptures. And, uh, until you pick that up and see that, then you, you, you slouch wise and you're reading a scripture. It doesn't come through and you don't ponder on things as clearly as you are. Until you see that, and put things in that focus and understand it from the divine nature standpoint, see? Now, for example, let's turn to Enoch and see his picture. Enoch's experience, let me turn to, let's begin with chapter 7 now of the, of the book of Moses and read a few verses here in order to pick up the preliminary uh, and get it in its full context. Begin, for example, with uh, verse 35. Behold, I am God. Man of holiness is my name. Man of counsel is my name. And endless and eternal is my name also. Who does it appear is speaking? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Who is speaking? Uh, let's, let's go on. Uh, verse 50. And it came to pass that Enoch continued his cry unto the Lord, saying, I ask thee, O Lord, in the name of thine only begotten, even Jesus Christ, that thou wilt have mercy upon Noah and his seed, that the earth may nevermore be covered by the floods. Who does it appear He's addressing. To whom does it appear he's addressing? To the Father. Okay? Let's go to another now. 53 to 55. And the Lord said, Blessed is he through whose seed Messiah shall come. For he saith, I am Messiah. Now this being to whom he was talking now is who? I am Messiah, the King of Zion. The rock of heaven, which is broad as eternity, whoso cometh in at the gate and climbeth up by me shall never fall. Wherefore, blessed are they of whom I have spoken, for they shall come forth with songs of everlasting joy. And it came to pass that he cried unto the Lord, saying, When the Son of Man cometh in the flesh. Now he's back on the theme and he's talking to the Father. You see that? And yet this being to whom he's speaking, he says, I am Messiah. You see that? He says, When the Son of Man cometh in the flesh, shall the earth rest. I pray thee, show me these things. And the Lord said unto him, Look. And he looked and beheld the Son of Man lifted up on the cross after the manner of men. Now turn with me to verse 59 and 60. And here's, here's the clincher, so hang on to your seats on this one. Enoch has seen the atoning mission of Christ, and he's seen how he got roughed up, if I can speak of it in that way, and he sees the results of it, but uh, it says in verse 58, Enoch wept and cried unto the Lord, saying, When shall the earth rest? And Enoch beheld the Son of Man ascending up unto the Father, and he called unto the Lord, saying, now, he's speaking to this being that he's been talking with, and he called to the Lord, Wilt thou not come again upon the earth? Now, who is he talking to? That being who had come on the earth, right? He says, For as much as thou art God, and I know thee, and thou hast sworn unto me and commanded me that I should ask in the name of thine only begotten Son, wherefore, skip a line or two, wherefore, I ask thee, addressing the Father, I ask thee in the name of thine only begotten Son, 
if thou will not come again on the earth. Now that's garbly goot. Unless you understand it in the right way. It's a, it's massacring the king's English. It's distortion. There's something wrong. Unless you understand it in the right way. You see that? And the right way then is to know that that being to whom Christ, uh, Enoch is speaking, is Christ, the Father and the Son. And he's speaking to him as both the Father and the Son. You see that? He's speaking, and, and, and Jesus is answering him in that capacity. And he says, Thou art God, and I know thee. He's not some kid who's babbling and doesn't know what he's talking about. This is one of the great prophets of all time. And he said, I know you. I know who you are. I know who I'm talking to, see? And I ask thee, in the name of thine only begotten Son, if thou will not come again on the earth. I ask thee, the Father, in the name of thine only begotten Son, if thou will not come again on the earth. You see that? Now, unless you understand in that light, it becomes distorted. And you say, wow, boy, there's something wrong. You've got some printer's airs there. You know that? There's something left out. But there's nothing left out. Rather, instead, it's one of the great revelations of, of the pre-earth Christ who acted in the office, power, and capacity of the Father. Now, can you see that? Now, let me turn to Ether chapter 3 with you. This is, this is Book of Mormon, but it's very helpful and it does tie in and relate. Ether chapter 3 is the account of the brother of Jared communicating with the pre-earth Christ some near 2,000 years B.C. Long time B.C., anyway. And uh, note, for example, uh, the nature of the experience. Let me just read it with you. This is, let's start with verse, verse 6 here for a minute. Let me read with you. It came to pass that when the brother of Jared had said these words, Behold, the Lord stretched forth his hand and touched the stones one by one with his finger. And the veil was taken from off the eyes of the brother of Jared, and he saw the finger of the Lord. And it was the finger, it was as the finger of a man. Light unto flesh and blood. And the brother, that's significant, so hang on to that one. And the brother of Jared fell down before the Lord, for he was struck with fear. And the Lord saw that the brother of Jared had fallen to the earth, and the Lord said unto him, Arise, why hast thou fallen? And he said unto the Lord, I saw the finger of the Lord. Now note in verse 4, he says, O Lord, with thy finger... Uh, stretch forth thy finger and touch these stones. And then when he did it, <laughs> he buckled his knees. <laughs> you see that? Because he saw something that was like flesh and blood. He saw something, and that, was, that, that startled him. And he feared and he fell to the earth. Now that's important. And let me, we'll come to that in just a minute here. He says, and he said to me, I saw the finger of the Lord, and I feared lest he should smite me, for I knew that, I knew not that the Lord had flesh and blood. Okay? And the Lord said unto him, Because of thy faith thou hast seen, now note, that I shall take upon me flesh and blood. Now, did Brother Jared just see the pure prayer of Christ as a spirit being? And the answer is no. What did he see? Visually, he saw Christ as though he would be in mortality. You see that? The vision, the vision of the brother of Jared wasn't just of the pre-earth spirit of Christ. The vision was of Christ as he would be in his earthly ministry. That's the nature. And the focus... The focus was on Christ as the Son, not Christ as the Father. The focus is on Christ as the Son, and the vision is as he would be in his earthly ministry. Now, those are important points. 
And sometimes we don't read them, and then we read on, and there's some problems, and we don't know them, so we go on. Now he goes on and says, let's go back to verse 9, The Lord said, Because of thy faith thou hast seen that I shall take upon me flesh and blood, and never has man come before me with such exceeding faith as thou hast. For were it not so, ye could not have seen my finger. Sawest thou more than this? And he said, Nay, Lord, show thyself unto me. And the Lord said unto him, Believest thou the words which I shall speak? And he answered, Yea, Lord, I know that thou speakest the truth, for thou art a God of truth, and canst not lie. And when he had said these words, behold, the Lord showed himself unto him, and said, Because thou knowest these things, thou art redeemed from the fall. Therefore... Ye are brought back into my presence, therefore I show myself unto you. Behold, I am he that was prepared in the foundation of the world, this statement we read before, to redeem my people. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, I am the Father and the Son. So he's appearing as the Son, but telling him he's also the Father. You see that? Now, when he appeared to Enoch, he appeared to the, as the Father and showed Enoch that he was also the son. Now, there's a reverse situation there. You see that? The focus on Enoch was the father. The focus of the brother Jared was the son, even as he would be in his earthly ministry. You see that? And then the explanation of Enoch was that, that he, as the father, was also Messiah and would be the son. You see that? The explanation to the brother of Jed that he as the son is also the father. And there's the reverse situation. Now when you see that, then you can understand the rest of what's said. He says, verse 15, And never have I shown myself unto man whom I have created. Now this is Christ, and he appeared to the brother, and then he appeared to Enoch. And he's saying, Never have I showed myself unto man. Is that contradictory? And the answer is no. Because to Enoch, how did he appear? The father. To the brother of Jared, how did he appear? The son. And it's the first time that he has ever revealed himself with the primary emphasis on the office of the son to any man. You see that? Never have I shown myself uh, unto man whom I have created, for never has man be believed in me as thou hast. And that doesn't mean just on, with the intensity that you believed. But never has man believed me as you have. It's talking about the quality and the kind of, of faith and the kind of belief. And apparently then the brother of Jared had enough experience. See, if you read the earlier chapters of, of the book of Ether, the Lord comes down in a cloud and he talks with the, with the brother of Jared for a long time. He doesn't see him, but he hears his voice and he talks with him, see? And so when he comes then to this experience, he can say, Never has man believed in me as you have. And you say, Well, didn't Enoch believe in him like as much as the brother of Jared? Well, Enoch was a stammering young boy. And the first thing he did was apologize. Now, why have you chosen me, Lord? I, I, I can't speak very well. I, I don't, don't talk too much. Now, why have you chosen me, see? And he's kind of back on his heels. Now, what's the situation with the brother of Jared? He's right on the balls of his feet. He, Lord, show me, show me, show me yourself. See that? And then there's another feature to his faith, and that is the kind of faith that he had. And apparently, the kind of faith that he had—not that he had full knowledge of it—but the, the nature of his faith was such that Christ could reveal Himself as He would be in His earthly ministry. You see that? Never has man believed in me as thou hast. Seest thou that you... And then he goes on, Seest thou that you created after mine own image? Yea, even all men were created in the beginning after mine own image. And then he explains, Now this body which ye now behold is the body of my spirit, and man have I created after the body of my spirit. And even as I appear unto thee in the spirit, will I appear unto my people in the flesh. And now Moroni makes this commentary. And now as I, Moroni, said, I could not make a full account of these things which are written. Therefore it sufficeth me to say, and note his explanation, Jesus showed himself unto this man in the Spirit, 
even after the manner and in the likeness of the same body, even as he showed himself unto the Nephites. You see that? Now, what was the nature of the brother Jared's vision then? Just the free earth spirit? Yeah, he saw that. But it's the first time Christ had appeared in the office of the Son. And not only in the office of the Son, but revealing himself as he would be in his earthly ministry. And he saw, the brother Jared saw him in that sense, and as he would be when he ministered with the Nephites, with the physical body. You see that? And yet, uh, uh, and that's, that, that's, that's a unique experience. And it's a first time experience. But that's not the first time that the Lord ever appeared in it for anyone. He appeared to Enoch. He appeared to Adam on the, in the valley of Adam on Diamond, the great council there. So the Lord appeared to Adam, didn't he? And yet he's talking about never I have done this before, see? Never as a person seen. Now you can't understand those things unless you've got the foundation for it. That's, that's, that's even today uh, a great obstacle. Uh, in the minds of a lot of people, they, they read that. And the more they've read the scriptures, the more it becomes a problem. Until you see the thing in its proper light. Well, and, and that's related then to Eve's vision. It may be appropriate then that we should say something about it here. Now, Christ then speaks in the office and power and capacity to the Father. Let's make one point along the way, and that is this. That angels and prophets can speak as though they were Christ. You read Isaiah, and and he just didn't say, now the Lord told me, and I put quotes on the Lord said, he just goes right on and speaks just as though he is Jehovah. And all the prophets do that. I think that's the meaning then of section 21, verse 5 there, where the Lord says to the church, about the living prophet. His words shall you receive as if from mine own mouth. See? And I have learned by practical experience that even if you don't think the prophet has all the facts and knows the full picture, the revelatory power that rests upon him in times of decision are such that you'd better heed that word fully and exactly. Receive his word as though it were the Lord himself, see. And that's, that's the picture of things, see. Now, for example, to just illustrate that a little bit, in the third chapter of the book of Exodus, you have the account of the burning bush. Now, in the burning bush episode, Moses is out tending his sheep there at Mount Horeb, which is another name for Mount Sinai. And uh, as he's doing so, then, he sees this rather interesting phenomenon. And the record says here, beginning with verse 1, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire, out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him. Now note, you have an angel up there, and now it's God. God called unto him out of the bush, uh, and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And uh, he said, Draw nigh uh, hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou stand is this holy ground. More I said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know uh, their sorrows, and so forth. See? All right, now, who is he talking to, really? Who is doing the communicating on this occasion? Let me turn with you over to the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. Now, this is a classic statement by Stephen. He knew, he knew his history, and he knew his doctrine. 
And uh, he's really bombarding the Jews for their denial of Christ and their crucifixion of Christ. And he's just letting the artillery flow without, without uh, uh, restriction. And it cost him his life, but he did it. But the point I want to make, then, is uh, uh, what he says. Here in verse 35, for example, he says, This Moses, whom they refused, the Israelites refused at first to follow when he was a prince of Egypt, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. What did the angel say? I am the God of thy fathers. Right? Now, that's inconsistent unless you know what? But angels have power of attorney. They speak by the power of the Spirit. They have the flow of revelation in their life. They have the position before God and man so that they can speak as God. And this angel did that. You see that? Turn, for example, to, to Exodus chapter 23. Uh, here you have the case of ancient Israel. Uh, in the rebellion, and that rebellion was such that the Lord finally got nauseated with them. He had been down there personally, trying to bring them to himself. He came down on Mount Sinai, and the whole mount was covered with light and glory and fire. It was, the mount was burning. Now, this is the great first great fireside in history, you know. And the Lord was there personally, see? And, uh, and they still then backed off and stood on their heels and said, Hey, Moses, you go talk to Lord. We, we, we just don't feel comfortable with it, see? And finally the Lord got disgusted and said, Hey, I'm not going to teach class any longer. I'm going to send you my graduate assistant. And uh, he'll teach you. <laughs> you see that? And, uh, and this is what he says now about that graduate assistant. Verse 20. He says, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him. And obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, now notice, for my name is in him. Now what does that mean? My name is in him. And then he goes on and says, But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, and do all that I speak, you see the relationship there? Then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies, and an adversary unto thine adversaries. Now, that angel had the right to speak and act as though he were God, and it wasn't just that he had what we call in the legal world the power of attorney, but rather there was an indwelling relationship so that that angel had the, the revelatory power of Jehovah within him. And so he says then, if that will obey his voice, because the angel is the one articulating it, but what's he saying? He's not saying what he's saying of his own self. He says, and do all that I speak, he's saying, do all that I speak. Now, it's that relationship, and prophets use that relationship. Prophet could stand here and say, I am the Lord Jesus Christ, and here is my message. And the ancient prophets used to do that kind of thing all the time. I am Jehovah, and here is, the, here is my law to you. And he has that right. The name of God is in him, and you obey his voice as if from the Lord's own mouth. You see that relationship? Now, that's the relationship. And if we follow that, then we don't go off up to Manti somewhere. We don't do that. Rather, instead, we keep in line with the living prophet, and we follow his counsel and get the Spirit of the Lord, and we don't experience what the Lord is talking about here in Third Nephi when he talks about distorted peoples, and he says, they have joy in their work for a season. Because any time you go out and practice truth, there's a joy that comes from them, even if it's something beyond what the living prophet wants you to practice, and with some distortion. He says, but in due time they're hewn down and cast into the fire. And that's the end result, see? That's the end result. 
All right, now angels and gods speak. Now, in that sense, let me turn to the, to the subject of Christ as the only begotten Son. Whenever we use that term, the only begotten, we apply it generally to Christ's conception and birth in the flesh as the only person begotten of the Father in this mortal uh, immortality with glory and power within him. When you use the term only begotten, we, we usually think of it in that way. Do any of you think of it in any other way? Raise your hand if you do. All right, there's one or two of you who think of it in, in, in another way. And uh, that other way is highly significant. Uh, let me just uh, develop a few ideas with you on that. First of all, there are other stages of life than the physical stage. Now, we know that. Uh, I'll give you a couple of other illustrations. There's spirit life. There's the kind of life that we had a hundred years ago. <clears throat> What's spirit life? It's the life that you have by reason of the organism that we call a spirit body, which we possess, right? Now, spirit life is all that you can do, the life that you can feel, the things that you can, that you can do and accomplish, the, the kind and the quality and the nature of existence that you have as an organized spirit. Uh, but we know that while that was important and there was a first estate, that that's not the end of the ballgame. That there needs to be adding upon. As, as the Lord says in the book of, of, of Abraham, those who keep the first estate shall be added upon. See? And so we come then into mortality under the powers of the fall to get a physical body away from God's presence where we're not as fully responsible uh, with this new organism that we get. So that you can, and I don't say do this justifiably, so you can tinker a little bit and not be held as responsible as you would be if you were in God's presence. And the law was there, and if you stepped out of line, you would you would be zapped with the divine power of justice. This is probation. Probation implies a time of trial. It also, provides, it also implies a, a little agency and a little opportunity to feel and learn who you are and what you've got. And then to bring that into harmony with the Lord, so that what you have then uh, is sanctified and uh, uh, utilized then for, for, for the purposes for which it's given. See? Now, in mortality, the physical body is, first of all, an obstacle. It's a deterrent. Why? Because it's a corrupt body. And because you're out of God's presence. And because until you sanctified that organism so that the spirit flows into it, then you're always bumping up against the corruption in it, Jimmy. And that corruption then deflects your emotions and your feelings. It's kind of like being out on a deer hunt. And you see a big four-point buck over there and there's a whole bunch of brush in between you and him. But you can see him. And so you pull down and get a bead on him, and you squeeze off the round, and boom, it follows its trajectory. But there's a big fat willow about that, about right in its path. And it hits that on the side. And what happens? You see that? It goes that way, see? And your butt goes bouncing off. Now, similarly, you've got a physical body. It's a corrupt body. The scriptures speak of it as such, see? And, uh, but they're the emotions that are, that are part of it, that are built into it. And when your spirit then desires uh, action and the elements of corruption are there, if you don't watch it, they'll hit that willow and they'll deflect it off. You see that? And the physical body then is a deterrent until you come down to the spirit of humility and really... Keep humble, and that's why you need to have half a family home even at a young age and really teach them the promptings of the Spirit, see, and to live by it. And when you meet those things where it's an obvious deflection, then, then you, you begin to act with humility and with faith and keep things in line. And finally, when you sanctify the physical body, then it becomes an instrument of power. And particularly, 
but it's raised, the fundamental elements are raised in the resurrection and raised to the level of the Spirit and purified and infused with the power of the Spirit, and fused with it in, as an organism, see, then it becomes a tremendously powerful organism, see that? And spirit and body inseparably connect, then bring you the fullness of joy, see? But, uh, <clears throat> but the physical, then, to start with, then, is, is, the, is an obstruction. Now, there are different stages of life. There's spirit life, there's physical life. And the great challenge is to go through a new birth, a new birth, to be born again into the kingdom of God. And when you're born again, you don't just receive a remission of sins, you also begin to have the divine attributes centered in you. And we'll talk about that a little later. The rebirth program, and the, one of the classic statements in Scripture is in Moses chapter 6, on the doctrine of rebirth. And as you're born again then, you have infused into you the divine nature. You don't just get a remission of sins. The record of heaven dwells in you. The truth of all things, the power of all things, they begin to dwell within you, and they begin to change and transform you into a new creature in Christ. And you take upon yourself his name, and you enter into a newness of life. And that's not just a, a statement in hyperbole or a symbolic. It's an actual, literal newness of life. And you become sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. All right, now there's more than one stage of life. There's also a stage which we call priesthood life. Um, section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, beginning with verse 6 of the, of the Revelation, is talking about what uh, uh, the Lord calls here... <clears throat> the sons of Moses according to the holy priesthood. Now, he's not saying Moses' sons in the flesh. He's saying the sons of Moses according to the holy priesthood. And uh, then he goes on and says, for example, in verse uh, 33, For whoso is faithful unto the obtaining of these two priesthoods, the Melchizedek and the Aaronic, of which I have spoken, and the magnifying of their calling, are sanctified by the Spirit unto the renewing of their bodies, and they be, that they become the sons of Moses and of Aaron. Now, they're not Moses' sons and Aaron necessarily in the flesh, but they're Moses' sons and Aaron in priesthood life. Now, what is priesthood life? In section 50 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord says this, of one who is ordained. Begin with verse 27, he says, Wherefore he is possessor of all things, for all things are subject unto him, both in heaven and on the earth. Now note what's subject to him. The life and the light, the spirit and the power, sent forth by the will of the Father through Jesus Christ. Now, what is priesthood? Well, it's the mind of God. It's the authority of God. It also is the channel through which the life of God is made manifest. And so one who possesses the priesthood then uh, possesses all things in heaven and earth, the life and the light, the spirit and the power sent forth through the will of the Father, through Jesus Christ. Now, in priesthood, priesthood life, in priesthood life, Jesus gets priesthood life and all of its rights and powers directly from the man of holiness. And we get priesthood, priesthood life, and priesthood power and authority through Jesus Christ. Over here in the 107th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, it's talking about uh, uh, why the priesthood is called Melchizedek. And it says, uh, why the first priesthood called Melchizedek, verse 2 of section 107, is because Melchizedek was such a great high priest. Before his day, it was called the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. Now, it wasn't the holy priesthood after the order of the man of holiness. You see that? 
Jesus gets his priesthood and its life and its power from the man of holiness. And he is the son of the man of holiness. We've all quoted uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 5 verse 4. Uh, where Paul's writing says, No man takes this authority unto himself except he was called of God, as was Aaron. How many of you know what's in chapter 5, verse 5? What's the next verse, in other words? Let me read it to you. He says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today, the day of ordination, today have I begotten thee. Now, who was Christ then? He was the son of the Father in spirit life. He was the son of the Father in the flesh. In the spirit life, he was not the only begotten, because there are a lot of others who are born of the Father, right? And so he's not the only, he, he's the only, he, he is the only begotten son then in, in priesthood life. No other person gets authority from the Father, see? And particularly now in respect to the divine nature. He gets them directly from the Father. And then he is appointed as our Lord and our God and as our Father. He is Alpha and Omega. He is the, the beginning and the end. He's the author and the finisher. He's the revelator of the Father. And he gives those divine powers then to us. Now, there are several stages of life. There's spirit life. There's that life associated with the Holy Spirit, or the glory of God, uh, or the divine nature. There's priesthood life. There's resurrected life, and Christ is raised up by the glory of the Father in the resurrection, as Paul says in Romans. But we're not raised up by the glory of the Father. We're raised up by Christ, and he becomes our Father in resurrection. And we then become his sons and daughters in eternal life. We become his sons and daughters in... Uh, the fullness of celestial glory and in the ultimate and final one, the one in which uh, the terms inheritance and eternal dominion are applicable to describe, then he inherits all things from the Father. And we become joint heirs through Christ, not with Christ, through Christ of all that the Father has. And so in how many ways then is Christ the only begotten? The only begotten means he's the only one begotten in that particular stage of life, right? Well, there are several. There are several. And uh, in that sense, then, he's not merely the only begotten in the flesh. Now, when he came into mortality, and here again you have to study the scriptures like a scientist studies a scientific formula. Turn, for example, to John chapter 1. And do a little pondering on this and see what John is really, really saying. Now note, for example, verse 14. He's talking, starts at the beginning with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then coming down to verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. <clears throat> We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. I didn't say we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten. He's talking about Christ in mortality or on this earth. Christ wasn't mortal, by the way. But he's talking about Christ in this mortal state. And he's, uh, he's saying now, we beheld his glory, the glory as of. It's like to. It's what he, it was what the thing that existed before. You see, it's the only begotten that was there. And his glory in, in, on earth was as that glory of the only begotten which existed prior to that. 
That's what he's saying. You see that? Now, let me turn to the book of Moses and let's run through on that just a little bit in order to see it as we, as we need to see it uh, properly. In the book of Moses, you have an interesting experience recorded. Uh, first of all, let's go back t- to Moses chapter 1, pick the story up there. And then come to it uh, uh, in some of the earlier verses in chapter 1. In verse uh, uh, 32, for example, By the word of my power created I them, which is, not which will be, which is mine only begotten, who is full of grace and truth. And worlds without number have I created, and I also created them for mine own purpose. And by the Son I created them, which is mine only begotten. Now, what's he saying? Does the term only begotten apply to Christ here in, in, on earth? Not as he's using it there. Not as he's using it there. You see that? Now, for example... Let's turn back to a, a few verses here in, in verse 13, for beginning, where Moses has his encounter with the adversary. It says, It came to pass that Moses looked upon Satan and said, Who art thou? For behold, I am a son of God in the similitude of his only begotten. And where is thy glory that I should worship thee? And then they have this encounter in verse 16. Moses says, Get thee hence, Satan. Deceive me not, for God said unto me, Thou art after the similitude of mine only begotten. Not, not my son who will be, but you're after the similitude of mine only begotten. And he, and he also called me, I uh, gave me commandments when he called me out of the burning bush, saying, Call upon God in the name of mine only begotten. And then Moses looks at uh, Satan and says, uh, I will not cease to call upon God. I have other things to inquire of him. For his glory has been upon me, wherefore I can judge between him and thee. Depart hence, Satan. And now when Moses had said these words, Satan cried with a loud voice and rent upon the earth and commanded, saying, I am the only begotten. Worship me. Now he didn't say, I will be the only begotten, alluding now to the coming of himself, as he would in, in saying it in that way, into the flesh. I am the only God. I am the person in whom the Father has centered his glory, his power, his life, his truth. Therefore, worship me. You see, only begotten there isn't a future thing referring to Christ's ministry and mortality and birth and mortality. Only begotten as it's used in the pearl of Christ is an, um, an immediate thing. It's an immediate thing. God created worlds without number by the only begotten. Now, what does he mean by that? He means that from the very beginning, as the Lord says in, in the book of Third Nephi, that I was with the Father from the beginning. And from the very beginning, the Father then centered his truth and his light and his power in the firstborn, who thereby became the only begotten, the only one who was his son in divine nature, in glory, in power. And Jesus utilizing the power of the Father, the divine nature, the spirit, the glory, created worlds without number. And Lucifer comes along and says, Worship me, I am the only begotten. And when Jesus comes to flesh and adds another dimension to his relationship by being the only one in in this fallen state to receive the physical body, Then John says, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten. You see that? Now, that's where you have to study the thing through and see what it's really saying, see? And see what it's really saying. Now, in that sense, then, Christ stands in the stead of the Father. He did so in the creation. He used the glory of the Father, the divine nature. The living powers, those powers of life, and he is the center of them, and he is the only one who is begotten by the Father in that relationship. And that then extends into the priesthood, and Christ receives priesthood authority directly from the Father. 
And we then receive it from him. And it's called the priesthood after the order of the Son of God. And when we receive the priesthood, we sing the song, Come all ye sons of God who have received the priesthood. See? And we're talking about a new dimension in life. We're talking about us being brothers in priesthood in God, namely in Christ. Can you see that picture? And Jesus is the only begotten in that role. Now, the great Christ helps us on that. We, again, as members of the church, we somehow haven't picked that one out very much, see? But it's a beautiful concept. Actually, see, the, term, the name only begotten is Christ's name for the Father. Now, you ponder on that for a month or two. The name only begotten is Christ's name for the Father. The Father centers himself, his glory and power in him. And by the only begotten, he creates worlds without number. By the only begotten, he redeems and he glorifies. And that's, that's Christ's name for the Father, the term only begotten. Okay? Now, another feature of this whole thing is what we call, or what book Moses calls, the word of the Father's power. Note this in verse 32. And by the word of my power have I created them. What does that mean, really? Do we just read it over and say, wow, I've got to get through the, this chapter tonight? <laughs> and, uh, or do you really ponder that one? What does it really mean? By the word of my power have I created them, that is, many worlds, which is mine only begotten. Now tie that in with the only begotten. The word of the Father's power is the only begotten. Now we're not talking about the flesh, is it? It's talking about the word of, of, the, of the Father's power, which is the only begotten. Joseph Smith made the explanation, and I'm quoting here from the lectures on faith. He says, when a man works by faith, he works by mental exertion instead of physical force. It is by words instead of exerting physical powers with which every being works when he works by faith. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Joshua said, and the great lights which God had created stood still. Still. Faith, then, works by words, and with these its mightiest works have been and will be performed. See, the word is the expression of the power of the soul in union with the Spirit. And it's the word of God's power. And this is the only begotten. You see that? By the word of my power created I these things, these many worlds, which is mine only begotten. And so the word of his power is a synonym for the word only begotten, and it is Christ's name for the Father. And therefore, he said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And by him all things are created. Now, do you pick that picture up there? Now, that's the scriptural revelation, then, of Christ. And it's one of those sacred, important insights that we need to see and to understand in order to, to comprehend Christ and to begin to get a relationship with him like we ought to get. Now, let me spend some time on God's ministry, then, to his various prophets. Let's start with Adam. Turn over to Moses chapter 4. <clears throat> Uh, the relationship of God with Adam then is interesting and, and uh, unique. Uh, verse uh, 14, for example, of chapter 4. They heard the voice of the Lord as they were walking in the garden. Now, this is after they had transgressed. They heard the voice, and then the Lord makes his appearance, and you get the judgments then of the fall, which are the explanations of what I call our mortal probation, our, our mortal heritage. When you get up in the morning and everything creaks and groans and, and all hell breaks loose and you wonder why you ever got out of bed that morning, just keep in mind that's your mortal heritage. 
And enjoy it, <laughs> if you can. <laughs> okay. Uh, turn over to Moses 5, verse 4 and 5. Adam and Eve, his wife, called upon the name of the Lord, and they heard the voice of the Lord in the way toward the Garden of Eden, speaking to them. And they saw him not, for they were shut out from his presence. And he gave unto them commandments that they should worship the Lord their God and offer the offerings, the firstlings of their flocks for an offering unto the Lord. And Adam was obedient unto the commandments of the Lord. And by his obedience, and he lived to be a grandfather, obeying without really knowing. And that's a tremendous example in and of itself. We've always got to, to know before we're going to do. Uh, we need to be sensitive enough to the Spirit so that you just feel the promptings of the Spirit, and then you do. And you just feel the witness of the living prophet, and then you do. You see that? And then the results come through, and you've had a trial of your faith, and, and you get the blessings that follow. Now, the final great uh, revelation and vision to Adam, and there were many, for example, if you'll turn over to... Chapter 6 of the book of, uh, of uh, uh, Moses, you'll find that the discourse that Enoch gives here concerning rebirth and the need to be born again was given originally to Adam. Uh, he makes the explanation that Adam fell and all of that. And then in verse 50, he says, But God hath made known unto our fathers that all men must repent. And he called upon our father Adam by his own voice, saying, I am God. Now, this is Christ speaking. I made the world and men before they were in the flesh. And he also said unto him, If thou wilt turn unto me and hearken to my voice and believe uh, and, and believe and repent of all thy transgressions and be baptized in, in water in the name of mine only begotten who is full of grace and truth. And, see, and so he gives the gospel plan then to Adam. and talks about rebirth and Adam obeys it. And he cries out then uh, with desire for the blessings in the latter part of the chapter. And he's caught away and he's by the Spirit and laid in, down into the water and is baptized and uh, the voice of the Lord speaks to him out of heaven, saying, Thou art baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost, and the, this is the record of the Father and the Son. And the name for that is that this is the celestial computer. This is the record of the Father and the Son. It's uh, the record of all that God speaks and all that God does. And uh, the divine computer is himself. It's his divine nature. And when we get born again, then it's given to abide in us. Verse 61. Therefore it's given to abide in you, the record of heaven. That begins to dwell within you. And if you learn to push the buttons in the right way and not to clutter up the screen and do it right, then the record of heaven is opened and the revelatory power of heaven is opened and the knowledge of God is opened. You see that? And it's not just theological knowledge. It's not just the smart brain that you need. You just need an honest heart and you need an open spirit. And you need to learn to walk with the Lord. You need to come to him in that way. With faith that he'll answer. He'll give you his truth. And then meet the challenge of discipline when he gives it. Discipline yourself. Bow on your knee and covenant. Not just say, Lord, help me. Covenant with him. That you're going to do better. You're going to stand up and be the person he ought to be. And then you'll begin to feel the strength and the power and the spirit, and it'll be a source of revelation. It'll be like living water springing up into everlasting life. There's no end to it. There's literally no end to it. You may get to the point, and I've done that in my ego at times, saying, boy, I don't know if there's anything else that the Lord knows. And then when you get humble again, and you begin to open things again, you know how ignorant you've been all the time and still are. I have people that say to me, boy, Brother Anders, if I just knew I'd be satisfied, if I just knew what you know. I say in my heart, you poor soul, you knew what I know and quit, you'd be damned. That's all there is to it. Because the thing is a living thing. It's living water. It's the bread of life. It's something that continues and it opens and expands bigger and bigger. It's like the, the horn of plenty. 
it opens and expands bigger and bigger. And even though you're not as sharp mentally at times, the flow of the Spirit is there and you feel it. And it's revelatory in its character and in its power, see? And that's the gospel, see? That's the gospel that we've received. Well, let's turn to the revelation then given to Enoch. Over here, and there's several divisions of that. I don't know that we've ever really handled this thing as, as it ought to be handled, or even, can I say, compartmentalized it as it ought to be. For example, in Moses chapter 6, start with verse 26. I went through and made just a few notes here. Uh, to, to pick up the Lord's ministry to Enoch at the various stages of Enoch's life that we have a record of in the Pearl of Great Price. And here in verse 20 he says, well, let's go back to 26. He says, And it came to pass that Enoch journeyed in the land among the people, and as he journeyed, the Spirit of God descended out of heaven and abode upon him. And he heard a voice from heaven saying, Enoch, my son, prophesy unto this people and say unto them, Repent, for thus saith the Lord, I am angry with this people, and my fierce anger is kindled against them, for their hearts have waxed hard, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes cannot see afar off. And for these many generations, ever since the day that I created them, have they gone astray, and have denied me, and have sought their own counsels in the dark, and in their own abominations have they devised murder, and have kept uh, not kept the commandments which I gave unto their father Adam. Noted all sinners back with him. Wherefore they have forsworn themselves, and by their oaths they have brought upon themselves death, and a hell have I prepared for them if they repent not. And uh, this is a decree which I have sent forth in the beginning of the world for mine own mouth, for mine own mouth, and the foundation thereof, and by the mouths of my servants and my thy fathers have uh, thy, my servants, thy fathers, have I decreed it, even as it shall be uh, sent forth in the world unto the ends thereof. And Enoch, uh, when Enoch heard the voice, uh, heard these words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord and spake unto the Lord and saying, Why is it that I have found favor in thy sight? See? Now that's commendable in a lot of ways. That's commendable. You know, you wonder why. Now, why, why have I been born? Where I am. Why has the Lord given me, you know, what he's given? Uh, but put that alongside of the brother of Jared. See, so put that alongside where uh, it's one thing, it's one thing to be humble, and I'm not militating in any way against it. But it's also another thing to have that positive dynamics that we call faith. To get up on the balls of your feet in the spirit of humility and faith. Be. It's one thing just to be humble and sit back, and it's another thing to, mm, and that's what the brother of Jared did. See, Lord, show, show yourself to him. Of course, he'd had the experience of these earlier times of talking with the Lord for hours at a time, So, and this is brand new to Enoch, see, and so you have to balance the, the facts then in that whole situation. He says, Why is it that I have found favor in thy sight, and am but a lad? And all the people hate me, and I am slow of speech, wherefore am I thy servant? And the Lord said unto Enoch, Go forth, and do as I have commanded thee, and no man shall pierce thee. Open thy mouth, and it shall be filled. And I will give thee utterance, for all flesh is in mine hands, and I will do as seemeth me good. Say unto this people, Choose ye this day to serve the Lord God who made you. Behold, my spirit is upon you. Note this isn't, hey, now you know me theologically, but my spirit is upon you. Wherefore, all thy words will I justify. Now, if those words are dictated by the Spirit of, of Christ, then it's Christ in Enoch, is it not? And he will justify those words. And he says, The mountains shall flee before thee, and the rivers shall turn from their course. And thou shalt abide in me. Now, note that indwelling relationship. Thou shalt abide in me, and I in you. Therefore, walk with me. Now, can you apply that to yourselves? I've pondered that on occasions and, and uh, just literally said, boy, you know, I'd like that kind of a relationship. Now, what have I got to do to get it? And I don't know in my stinking dirty heart what to do to get it. You've got to, you've got to get things clean and not just clean in the sense of the big things. You've got to fine-tune that thing down so that you live 
in the flow of the Spirit. And so when you, anything happens that, that nudges you out, you immediately pull back in, see? And that's not some kind of sanctimonious life. That's, that's living the life of the gospel. And it's, it's life in its fullness. It's life in its joy and in its strength. And even though the Lord sends you through the Colorado Rapids before, and he's done that with me. And you feel like you're in a leaky bathtub without a, with a broken oar, and there's nothing there but him, even though that's the case. Then there's still that silent, solid peace and that strength. And there's value that comes out of it, and there's trust that you learn. You learn to trust the Lord. You learn to walk with him, and he is in you, and you are in him, see? And that's what he's talking about. And the Lord spake in Enoch and said unto him, Anoint thine eyes with clay, and wash them, and thou shalt see. And he did so. And he beheld the spirits which God had created, and beheld also the things which were not visible to the natural eye. And from thenceforth came the saying abroad in the land, A seer hath the Lord raised up unto his people. Now, what is a seer? Well, a seer is one who sees through the medium of the Spirit. Now, there's a special instrument that the Lord has devised. We call it a Urim and thumb. And uh, a companion to it is a seer stone. Joseph had both, and he used both in his ministry, the translation of the Book of Mormon and so forth. See? A seer sees visually. The Urim and Thummim operates visually. For example, over here in the third chapter of the book of Abraham, chapter 3, verse 1, uh, the record says, for example, And I, Abraham, had the Urim and Thummim, which the Lord my God gave me in, unto me in Ur of the Chaldees. And I saw the stars that they were very great. See, the Urim and Thummim operates visually. Now, Joseph Smith, if I can put this in parenthetically, used the Urim and Thummim to translate. If you read, for example, chapter section 3 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 12, then this statement becomes meaningful. This is the episode of the loss of the 116-page book of Lehi, which Martin Harris lost. And uh, the Lord speaking to Joseph about it says, And when thou deliverest up that which God had given thee sight and power to translate. S-I-G-H-T. Now, Joseph translated as a seer. He didn't translate just by feeling his heart and seeing if it was warm and whether it was right. And I'm sarcastically referring to section 9, which is a true principle. But there's more to it than that. And that's the point I want to make. See, he translated as a seer. Now, you can be a seer without using the Urim and Thummim. Enoch was a seer you know, on this occasion. Now, I'm convinced in my own mind that he had the Urim and Thummim. We know, for example, from the Prophet Joseph Smith's Egyptian alphabet and grammar, which he devised as uh, a means for the, crea for the translation of the book of Abraham. We know from that that, that Methuselah was the first of the ancient patriarchs to, to discover Kola by and through the Yerman Thummim. Now, Methuselah was Enoch's son. He has the distinction of being the oldest man that ever lived, and yet he died before his father. And I'll leave you to ponder on that one. <laughs> but if Methuselah had the Yerman Thummim, then I think Enoch probably did too, you see. But on this occasion, there's no evidence that he had the Urim and Thummim. The point is, he anointed his eyes with clay, and the Spirit rested upon him, and the act of obedience in doing what he did, not the, not the clay, but the act of obedience, brought him then into the final union that he needed, so that the veil parted, and he saw the Spirit's world, and he saw many things, and the saying went abroad that a seer hath the Lord our God raised up. Now that's Enoch's according to the record, first experience with the Lord. You see that? That's his first experience. Now, uh, let's come to the second one. Let's go turn over to, to chapter 7, uh, verse 2, beginning. Uh, it says, uh, And from this that time forth Enoch began to prophesy, saying unto the people, 
that as I was journeying and stood upon the place called uh, Mahajah and cried unto the Lord, there came a voice out of heaven saying, Turn ye and get ye upon uh, the Mount Simeon. And it came to pass that I turned and went up on the mount. And as I stood upon the mount, I beheld the heavens open, and I was clothed upon with glory. And I saw the Lord, and he stood before my face, and he talked with me, even as a man talketh one with another, face to face. And he said unto me, Look, and I will show unto thee the world for the space of many generations. And it seemed to pass, it says, that I beheld the valley of Shum, and lo, a great people which dwelt in tents, which were in the valley of the people of Shum. And again the Lord said unto me, Look, and I looked towards the north, and I beheld the, the people of Canaan, which dwelt in tents. And the Lord said unto me, Prophesy. And I prophesied, saying, Behold, the people of Canaan, which are numerous, shall go forth in battle array against the people of Shum, and shall slay them. And they shall utterly be destroyed, and the people of Canaan shall divide themselves in the land, and the land shall be barren and unfruitful, and other people shall dwell there but the people of Canaan. For behold, the Lord shall curse the land with much heat. Well, he goes on, and he talks about various things then in relation to the situation of that time. Let me just conclude with verse 11. And he gave unto me a command and said that I should baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son, which is full of grace and truth. Now, the word, he didn't say which are full of grace and truth. He says which is full of grace and truth. Did you pick that one up? Let me give you another one. Over here in... Uh, Wow, verse Moses 5. Moses 5. <clears throat> see, if you, see if you pick that one up. This is verse 9. And that day the Holy Ghost fell upon Adam, which beareth record of the Father and the Son, saying, I am the only begotten of the Father. Now, what's the antecedent to I? The Father and the Son. Okay? And the Father and the Son is whom? The only begotten. You see that? And he was the only begotten then, not just waited to be come so in the flesh. See? I am the only begotten, henceforth and forever. And as thou hast fallen, thou mayest be redeemed, and so forth. See? Uh, see, the scriptures deal with Christ as the Father and the Son. Don't they? That's the point. In verse 11, he gave unto me commandment, I should baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son, which is, which is, Christ, i.e., Christ, which is full of grace and truth, and of the Holy Ghost, which beareth record of the Father and the Son. You see that? All right, now, after, after that one, then let's turn uh, to another account of Enoch, and this is over in Moses chapter 7, uh, verse 19 through 21. Now, this, <clears throat> this is getting later now in his ministry, and it says... Uh, He's, it talks about uh, about Zion and, and the glory of the Lord resting upon Zion in the previous verses. And uh, the Lord called it Zion because they're people of one heart and one mind. And then in verse 19, Enoch continued his preaching and righteousness unto the people of God. And it came to pass in his day that he built a city that is called the city of holiness, even Zion. <clears throat> And it came to pass that Enoch talked with the Lord, and he said unto the Lord, Surely Zion dwelleth, shall dwell in safety forever. But the Lord said unto Enoch, Zion have I blessed, but the residue of the people have I cursed. And it came to pass that the Lord showed unto Enoch all the inhabitants of the earth. And he beheld, and lo, Zion in process of time was taken up into heaven. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Behold, mine abode forever. See? Now, this particular experience with Enoch then gets us right into the Zion picture and then the translation picture. You see that? The Prophet Joseph Smith explains that the power of translation is a power of the priesthood. He says, for example, now the doctrine of translation, this is page 170 of the teachings, the doctrine of translation is a power which belongs to the priesthood. He says there are many things which belong to the powers of the priesthood and the keys thereof that have been kept hid from before the foundation of the world. They are hid for the, from the wise and prudent to be revealed in the last times. Okay. Now, 
in order to exercise the powers of translation, you've got to build Zion. You've got to make your calling and election sure. You've got to build Mount Zion. You've got to put Zion on her mount, the temple. You see that? And the sealing powers and the endowment of glory. As the Lord says in verse 17, the fear of the Lord was upon all nations, so great was the glory of the Lord, which is upon his people. Well, they, they established their lives on the temple. They built Mount Zion. They got the sealing powers. They made their calling and election sure. They got fullness of priesthood. Now, when you get into that realm of activity, then subject to the Lord's will, you can use the power of the priesthood in that sacred function of translation. You see that? And that's the thing that we're talking about here in Moses 7. He's got Zion built, and in process of time, then, he sees that the people of Zion will be translated. Now, finally, uh, the Lord's vision, revelation to Enoch, then, uh, in the translated state. And let's start with verse 23 of chapter 7. And there came generation upon generation, and Enoch was high and lifted up, even in the bosom of the Father and the Son of Man. And behold, the power of Satan was upon all the face of the earth, And he saw angels descending out of heaven, and he heard a voice, a loud voice, saying, Woe, woe be unto the inhabitants of the earth. And he beheld Satan, and he had a great chain in his hand, and it veiled the whole face of the earth with darkness. And he looked upon, up and laughed, and his angels rejoiced. And he beheld angels descending out of heaven, bearing testimony of the Father and the Son. And the Holy Ghost fell upon many, and they were caught up by the powers of heaven into Zion. See, after Enoch's Zion was translated, then those who remained on earth then, who embraced the gospel, were caught up to the city of Enoch. Now, that wasn't true of Methuselah. He's left in Lamech. Methuselah died the year of the flood. But uh, you leave a posterity then, but, but the righteous are finally gathered up and, and, and translated. It says, and it came to pass that the, that the God of heaven looked upon the residue of the people, and he wept, and Enoch bore record of it, saying, How is it that the heavens weep and shed forth their tears as the rain upon the mountains? And Enoch said unto the Lord, How is it that thou canst weep, seeing that thou art holy, and from all eternity to all eternity? And were it possible that man could number the particles of the earth, yea, millions of earths like this, it would not be a beginning of the number of thy creations. And thy curtains are stretched out still, and yet thou art there, and thy bosom is there. And also thou art just, and art merciful, and art kind forever. And thou hast taken Zion, and this is an important point, and to thine own bosom from all thy creations, from all eternity to all eternity. See? You can't enter into the Lord's presence and be his people unless you are Zion. Section 105 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Otherwise, I cannot receive my people unto myself. Now, we cannot, in our present state, get to the celestial kingdom. Can I put it that way? And be received by the Lord as a Gentile people. It can't be done. It just can't be done. We've got to build Zion. Now, hopefully, we've got a little time between here and the resurrection. But you finally got to come up to Zion. And section 76 talks about those who are in celestial kingdom. It says, these are they who have come to Mount Zion. They're those who have made it. It's kind of like uh, flying through a mountainous area, rather low in an airplane. The whole thing is covered with clouds. And you see down there the peak of a mountain over here. And you see the peak of a mountain over there and one over there and one over there. And you know which mountains are above the clouds. Now, that's the way judgment in the celestial kingdom will be. The Lord will just say, okay, who's made it? Who, have, who is it that has come? How many have come to Mount Zion? Have got their heads above the veil. Okay, you're celestial. If you haven't made it, and you're still rowing with one hand and backing water with another, and that's the case too often in our lives, then don't expect the Lord just to kind of put you on the, on the balance and on the scales and say, okay, this and this here, here's the good points and here's the bad, and maybe, maybe we'll make the celestial person. A celestial being is one who overcomes all things. And the great thing you overcome is the power of the veil. That's the great thing that you overcome, you see. 
And you do that by personal discipline, by faith. And those who are celestial are those who finally climb the ladder, and like the brother of Jared, the next step up is in. And they say, wow, you know, it's great here. It's great. That's the order of things. See? Well, the Lord reveals himself then to Enoch, and, and, and in that sense, and gives us some tremendous insights. Enoch at the initial call, Enoch later, Enoch in the Zion setting, Enoch in the translated setting, see? All of those then are a part of this, and they all tie in then with the eternal order that we call the holy order and, and uh, the Zion society. Now, coming down to Noah, Lamech's statement, for example, to Noah, and we're going to have to hurry again. I'm just uh, running out of time here. In Moses chapter 8, for example, verse 8 and 9, Lamech lived 100 years, and 182 years, and begat a son, and he called his name Noah saying, This son shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And then turn, for example, to uh, chapter verse 24 and 25. Now, let's go back, let's go back just a minute to uh, verse 16. It came to pass that Noah prophesied and taught the things of God, even as it was in the beginning. See, he's carrying on a tradition. And then in verse 24, uh, uh, verse 23, it, started, it came to pass that Noah continued his preaching to the people, saying, Hearken and give heed unto my words. Believe and repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, even as our fathers, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Now note the next phrase that ye may have all things made manifest. Now, what's the gift of the Holy Ghost for? So that you have a legal channel to come to God through the third member of the Godhead and have all things made manifest. And there's no limit except that which is right and prudent and applicable to you in a particular time in your life and, and a given situation. See? You can have all things manifest. It's, it's, uh, it's the great teacher of men. It's far better than all the universities on earth combined to give the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost and to wire a person up, if I can put it that way, with the Holy Ghost to be his personal private teacher. Now, we have that. We don't do much with it. We need to apply as much emphasis there as we, as we do in, in getting our education, and it'll give to us greater benefits, believe me, greater benefits than, than the educational process, although both of them are important. Now, when we come to the Lord's ministry with Abraham, and we might have to put some of this off a little bit, but <clears throat> let me at least uh, uh, open the subject, and we may come back to Abraham then a little later. Uh, We've already talked about Abraham in relation to the Holy Order yesterday. Now, beginning with chapter 1, verse 12. And it came to pass that the priest laid violence upon me, Abraham is reporting, and uh, that he might slay me also, and as they did those virgins. This is human sacrifice, and Abraham almost became a victim of it. And he says, tells about the bedstead, the iron bedstead that was made, verse 13. Then he goes on and says, that you may have an understanding of these gods. I have given you the fashion of them in the figure in the beginning of this, and that's the first facsimile. And then he says in verse 15, and as they lifted up their hands upon me, that they might offer me up and take away my life, behold, I lifted up my voice unto the Lord my God. And the Lord hearkened and heard and filled me with the vision of the Almighty, and the angel of his presence stood by me and immediately unloosed, unloosed my bands. And his voice was unto me, Abraham, Abraham, behold, my name is Jehovah. And here again an angel is talking. You see that? My name is Jehovah, and I have heard thee, and have come down to deliver thee, and to take thee away from thy father's house, from all thy kinfolk, into a strange land which thou knowest not of. And this because they have turned their hearts away from me, to worship the god of Elkanon, the god of Libnon, the god of Makmara, uh, Ma Makara, 
and the God of Korash and the God of Pharaoh and the God of Egypt or the king of Egypt. Therefore, I have come down to visit them and to destroy them who have lifted up their hands against the Abraham, my son, to take away my life. Behold, I will lead thee by my hand and I will take thee to put upon thee my name. Now, what does that mean? My name. I'll put upon thee my name. Remember how he said that about the angel? Put upon thee my name, even the priesthood of thy father, and my power shall be over thee. And as it was with Noah, so shall it be with thee. But through thy ministry my name shall be known in the earth forever, for I am thy God. And then a marvelous promise and blessing to Abraham, see? And uh, Abraham's ministry then, referred to here in chapter 2, of Abraham, verse 6 through 8, Abraham and Lot, my brother's son, prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord appeared unto me and said unto me, Arise and take Lot with thee, and I, for I purpose to take thee out of the land of Haran, and to make thee a minister, to bear my name in a strange land, which I shall give unto thy seed, even after thee, for an everlasting possession. For I am the Lord thy God, and I dwell in the heavens, and the earth is my footstool, and I stretch my hand upon where the sea, and it obeys my voice, and I cause the winds of the fire to be my chariot, and I say to the mountains, Depart hence, and behold, they are taken away by a whirlwind. My name is Jehovah, and I will, uh, and I know thee, and I know the end from the beginning, and therefore my hand shall be over thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee uh, above measure, and make thy name great among all the nations. And then, as he's doing this uh, and speaking uh, to Abraham later, then he gives Abraham a vision of his, Jehovah's, creations. Turn over to chapter 3, for example, of Abraham. He said, <clears throat> let's go to, uh, to verse... Uh, 11, Thus I, Abraham, talked with the Lord face to face, as one man talked with another. And he told me of the works which his hand had made. Now, this is Christ. It's not the Father. It's Christ. His hands had made. And he said unto me, My son, my son, and his hand was stretched out. Behold, I will show unto thee, uh, show uh, you all these. And he put his hand upon mine eyes and saw and I saw those things which his hands had made, which were many, and they multiplied before mine eyes, and I could not see the end thereof. I want to come back to that as we talk about the, the creations of God, but let's leave it at that point. Now, oh. pardon? Oh, we're going to have to take a rain check on some of this. <laughs> Uh, we've talked about Moses. Let me just summarize, say a few things summarily then. And, uh, Moses in Revelation in chapter 1. When did it take place? When did it take place? Well, let's turn back to that. We need to get that one in. We sometimes try to associate this with Mount Sinai. Now, this is not a Mount Sinai experience. Moses was the Lord 40 days after he got Israel out of Egypt. But uh, he's caught up to an exceedingly high mountain here. He talks with the Lord. The glory of the Lord is upon him. And if you study the first chapter very carefully, you'll be able to determine at what point in Moses' life this revelation was given. Now, for example, he has this encounter with the adversary. And uh, he... Uh, he says this, verse 17, And he, God, also gave me commandments when he called unto me out of the burning bush, saying, Call upon God in the name of mine only begotten. Now this revelation then, which included then the onslaught of the adversary, took place at what point in, in Moses' life? And the answer is after the burning bush, right? It's after the burning bush. Now, uh, read on, for example beginning with uh, verse 25, And he called upon the name of God and beheld the glory and his glory again. And he heard a voice uh, saying, Blessed art thou, Moses, for I, the Almighty, have chosen thee and, thou, and shall make thee uh, stronger than many waters, for they shall obey thy command as if thou wert God. And lo, I am with thee even to the end of thy days, for thou shalt deliver 
uh, my people from bondage, even Israel, my chosen. Now, what's the other point between which this vision took place? The burning bush and his journey to deliver Israel from Egypt. You see that? And so this was a preliminary, a preliminary thing preparatory to Moses before he went to Egypt to deliver the Lord's people. You see that? Because the Lord said, I will make the, the waters will obey your voice. That's the, that's the Red Sea. And thou shalt deliver my people. So this revelation was given before. And what does it say for the stature of Moses at that point? See, he had come up to the blessings of the second comforter. He had come up to be a seer where he saw. In many ways, only a seer can teach the gospel. The rest of us are signboard readers. Only a seer has been there and can say, I know, I have seen. I understand by personal experience. I climbed the mount. I got on top. And I saw it. And this is how you do it. That's what it means to be taught by a seer. All others are signpost readers. I read this inscription that says that, and therefore maybe this is what it means. You see that? Now, the Pearl Ray Prize then contains several important revelatory things that are so vital and important. I love that record. I think I've probably taught it probably a hundred times, a hundred courses on the Pearl of Christ. Been a rich experience, just a choice experience. And I've learned that Joda translated the book of Abraham. Don't let anyone kid you on that. Joda was a seer. That material there that is given is given by the revelation of God. And I bury that testimony humbly in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.